the world is being conditioned for things to come. What's ahead is both dark and glorious. The mark of the beast is simply an identification system that allows you to buy or sell to operate within society if you go along with it. And the beast himself is Antichrist. It's a submission to Antichrist and his system. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with two guests, Tom Hughes and Brandon Holthouse. Society is being conditioned today for a future kingdom that is very brief, just seven years. Believers will be gone for the time of Jacob's trouble, but we are here to see things aligning like never before. Jan and her guests discuss urgent issues for our day in this uninterrupted program. Here is today's programming. I had a conversation with my dad. He used to work for a company called Teledyne back in the early 1960s. And he was invited to a party in the Hollywood Hills. He said all the big wigs were there, Henry Singleton and so forth. And he said an individual showed up and they're standing in the backyard looking into the city of Los Angeles. You see all these, uh, all these lights in the city out there and all the people that are out there. Someday, we're gonna be able to control everyone. And he wasn't referring to just Los Angeles. Everybody is gonna be identified. It's called the mark of the beast. Choosing the mark is really choosing to either live or die. There's no escape from the system. Glad you can join me for Understanding the Times Radio today, and I hope that was an effective tease for the program for the hour ahead. We're going to be joined by ministry friends, Pastor Tom Hughes, Brandon Holthouse will join me later in the hour, and we are carrying Tom's newest book, Marking the Masses. I happen to have a cover endorsement on the book, as a matter of fact. And keep in mind that a system will be ready for the Antichrist. His reign is much too short for him to start installing a system when he arrives. It will be ready for him. The globalists of the world and others are committed to the dark agenda. We see building everywhere. And they're beginning to install his system so that when he is unleashed, after the believers are gone, there will likely be some phase of a cashless society and other things that we will try to have time to talk about here. There'll be a marking system implemented immediately upon his installation. The Bible calls it the mark of the beast. And I maintain that the system is on the horizon now. However, the implementation of it fully at least, will be again when the church is gone, believers are gone. There have been foreshadows of it for many years, as we will learn. Tom Hughes is head of Hope for Our Times. He's active in many areas of outreach, including his channel, very active online. He's a prolific author, a frequent conference speaker, and he was founding pastor of 412 Church in San Jacinto, California. Tom, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Jan, for having me on. It's wonderful to be with you. I'm a little bit overwhelmed with the whole subject matter, including some of the subject of the book, and that's not said critically at all. But I need you to clarify just a few things, if you would, because you say that your father worked for this company, Teledyne, back in the early 1960s. Are you suggesting in that little clip that he knew something that the rest of us didn't know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I heard the story over a number of years from my dad, but it was a few years back when I was talking with him and he said, you know, everything you talk about is what I was involved with back in the 1960s when I was at Teledyne. So at that point I said, dad, you know, I've heard it before, but I can never remember all the details and the names of individuals. So I'd like to record a conversation with you. And I did, I recorded it. It's about a half hour long. I'm not going to share it as a private conversation, although the entire conversation was all about really what we are experiencing right now with this global identification and tracking that undoubtedly is going to lead to the mark of the beast. How was he able to have all of this special knowledge, insight? My dad went to college and got his master's degree in chemistry. And because of that, he was hired 
by this company, Teledyne, as metallurgist. And there were only about five employees at the time. And it turns out it was Teledyne, Intel, and other companies that we have all heard of. And who he met there in the companies was Arthur Rock, specifically Henry Singleton was the one who was head of Teledyne at the time. Claude T. Shannon was part of this group. He's the father of information theory. Gordon Moore was part of the group. And they were all at this party that my dad was invited to. So you have a few different companies in there, all very small tech companies at the time. That's where the conversation came from. So Gordon Moore was there and he was known for Moore's Law. And he also was a chemist. Because of my dad's involvement in chemistry as a metallurgist, that's why he was involved in these companies in the very beginning. In fact, he was even offered to go up to Silicon Valley, but my mom talked him out of moving up there. As I indicated in my introduction, we're kind of being conditioned over the past many decades, being conditioned for what's coming. Now, we need to clarify, once this system blossoms, you and I are not going to be here. And I do think we need to emphasize that because we're talking as though we will be. But what you are talking about is a conversation that took place 60 years ago about some things that were going to transpire over the ensuing decades. Your father was a part of that early conversation, and did you have ongoing conversations? Did he see things morphing as we went into the 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera? He did, but my dad went into the finance world, so he didn't pay as much attention to it. He still stayed in a little bit of contact with some of the guys, but my dad's very intelligent. So because of that, he was able to pay attention to all of the things that are going on over the years. And we was able to track with them because he knew where all of it was leading. And he understands transistors and computer chips and all of that. Something I don't understand those things. He was part of that process in the very beginning. So for him to stay connected with the technology world and think it was a marvel at the same time, it came with a warning to him, especially when I started teaching Bible prophecy some 30 years ago. And then he was getting into Bible prophecy at the same time. So, yeah, he's been absolutely on the forefront of this even today. So here's probably an obvious question. I have said twice now that you and I will not be here for this terrible system once it unfolds. Why are we even talking about it then? And you do address these kinds of issues. So give me your thoughts here. We need to warn people. I firmly believe the rapture is going to take place before the confirmation of the covenant of Antichrist that's laid out in Daniel chapter 9 and other places in the Bible. But we're warning people because we see everything coming together. Right now, Israel has our attention. And a lot of other things are going on behind the curtain. It's like the globalists are using Israel as cover for moving forward with everything else, especially the global system the tracking, the identification, central bank digital currencies, all of these things are still coming. So when we're able to warn people right now, and if they don't receive Christ right now, guess what? The very words that we are saying now, they're going to realize after the rapture, these things are going to come true. I firmly believe, Jan, that there's many people that are going to come to faith in Christ after the rapture happens because we've been faithful to tell people Because it is really hard to look at all of the things that are taking place right now. And actually, reason in your mind is just a coincidence, Mm -hmm. especially if you have the Bible. So we show them the Bible. We leave things for them, programs like yours that people are listening to and sharing with their friends. Such a need to get the information out there to people because the day is going to come. I believe we're going to be standing before the Lord And there's going to be a reward for us in heaven because we were faithful to proclaim the gospel and tell people Jesus came the first time he's coming again. And here's how we can know. I have a few sound bites, Tom. They are of you in some other interviews. And I tried to pick out a few clips that would expand on what you and I are talking about. In this particular clip, you do bring into the conversation the digital ID that's up ahead. There's going to be central bank digital currency. In other words, what you and I are saying is that an entire system is on the horizon, could blossom at any moment. And we're just seeing little bits of it here and little bits of it there. Let me just play this short clip and come back and discuss it with you. So right now, so the the mark uh, is an identification. The Bible tells us this. There's going to be this mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is simply an identification that every person has to sell that 
allows them to either buy or sell, or does if they don't have the mark, the identification, they won't be allowed to buy or sell. What, what do we have? To, and by the way, the mark, according to the Bible, will be on your right hand or forehead. It's going to be one or the other. So you look at it now, you go, well, this is really remarkable because all of these globalists are saying, well, everybody's going to need an ID. They're getting, yeah. You're going to have to have a personal identification. If you do not have that, you will be able. You will not be able to um, operate within society. You're not right. going to be able to go to the grocery store. You're not going to be able to pay your rent on your house. You're not going to be able to buy hamburgers, which they're, which is another story because they're saying you can't eat meat. But that's yeah. another story. Yeah, so, I mean, eat bugs. If you have to be part of this system, the system is they're telling us digital currency, specifically. Uh, CBDC, centralized bank digital currency, uh, which is different than the other digital currencies that we've been hearing about for the last several years. What they're talking about is a digital currency that's controlled by the government and then ultimately is going to have one authority at the top of it. These things are not a coincidence. They are no. all happening, and the Bible did tell us it's going to come this way. And they're telling us it's for our own good. As for listen, we're going to have an economic crash, and this will keep everybody from suffering and dying, uh, from going hungry, that type of thing, right? So we we see it happening, but the mark of the beast is simply an identification system that allows you to buy or sell to operate yeah. within society if you go along with it. And the beast himself is antichrist; it's a submission to antichrist and his system. I think one thing that's important for folks to understand, Tom, is that folks are going to be eager to take this mark. It won't have to be forced on them. Absolutely. We know from the book of Revelation, it's an act of worship. But I was talking with one of our colleagues just recently about this, because there's so much resistance currently to certain things that the globalists are doing. But what's going to cause people to go along with it? Well, two things. One is the rapture is going to take place. And the other thing is, we know from Revelation chapter 6, you have the writer on the black horse, that there's going to be an economic collapse. And guess what, Jan, you've said it many times. Mr. Fix-It is going to show up on the scene with the answer to the problem. Hey, I'm here. I can fix these problems that you have. There will be an economic catastrophe that is going to happen. Listen, once the grocery stores are empty for three days, people are going to say, I'll do whatever it takes to be able to have groceries. So crash the current system. We're all hearing that that's what they're going to do. And then what do you bring in? You bring in digital currency and people will be saying, thank you for solving our problem. Now we can go on with our life. It was Klaus Schwab who said, by 2030, you'll own nothing and be happy. And it's like everything that these globalists are doing looks to me like it is an intentional plan to bring about this goal of submission to this global government. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Southern California, Tom Hughes, because we are carrying his newest book, Marking the Masses. It covers a broad span of topics. Can't get into every single issue in this particular segment, but it is in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. Go to my online store. And Tom, here's my question based on what we've just heard and what you just said. What do you think will prompt the nations of the world to give up their sovereignty and be a part of this whole crazy system? And again, you just said, and I totally agree, things will indeed be kind of in a mess. But you've got Xi Jinping, Emmanuel Macron, Vladimir Putin, the mullahs of Iran, for that matter, the U.S. Democrat Party, who they don't want to cede power to this guy. Are you kidding me? These that I just named, they're all about power and control. Will there be perhaps an international crisis that causes the leaders to cede power and bow down to this guy? Whatever that crisis is, it's unimaginable right now. There will be an international crisis. I'm convinced it will affect China and Russia, who are already not doing as well as the media would have us believe they are doing. Europe's in trouble. The U.S. is obviously in trouble. The whole world's got issues, and there are financial issues going on globally. With that, there's still another dynamic. I don't believe every world leader is going to willingly submit to this kingdom that's coming. We know we have the 10 kings, Revelation chapter 17. They give their power and authority to the beast. However, we also know from reading Daniel chapter 11, for example, there's certain areas 
of Jordan that are not going to submit. We know Egypt is not going to entirely submit to Antichrist. We know the Ezekiel chapter 38 battle seems to be where Russia, Iran, Turkey are operating according to their own methods. But granted, I believe the timing of that is going to be fairly early on. So we don't see a massive, like everybody on the globe is submitting to Antichrist. He's a beast. Revelation 13, who can make war with him? He does whatever he pleases almost within whatever God allows him to do. And we do know that there is a resistance that's going to build during the kingdom of Antichrist. It's a very short-lived kingdom, maximum of seven years. But the Bible's very clear. 144,000 Jews are saved early on. And then as you continue reading chapter seven of Revelation, what do we have? There are a massive number of people that are saved during the tribulation, so many that no man can number them that are saved at every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. That's the Gentile world. So not everybody is going along with him, but there's such power and such deception and delusion that there are going to be, I believe, the majority of the world's population is going to joyfully submit to him and look to him to be in their savior. But there will be some who will resist. Also, nationalism is a problem for globalism, and the globalists know this. And people, by nature, are always nationalistic. The Romans were, the Greeks were, all throughout history, and even today, if you're Mexican, I'm Mexican, I'm Canadian, I'm American, I'm Chinese, there is that the globalists will always have to fight against. So there will be resistance, and not everybody's going to be willing just joyfully surrendering to the system that's coming. Well, we watch America right now. I mean, $34 trillion in debt. I don't think anybody can wrap their brain around $34 trillion. And that's the debt that this country has. Should the Lord tarry, every listener's kids and grandkids and great-grandkids would be paying that forever and ever to the point where their own lifestyle is certainly not helped in the least. I just see it problems like that, immigration problems, on and on we could go. Many people today, at least in America, cannot even afford to buy a home anymore. They're just completely out of that opportunity. And all of this, I think, is just further setting the stage. People are getting to the point where they're saying, I give up, and somebody will come along and say, I have the answer. Absolutely. I look at it this way. The biggest concern today really isn't the technology of the mark of the beast. We know that's there. What it is, is the conditioning for the catalyst. There is a crisis, or I believe crises, that are coming. You mentioned the borders. Listen, I believe what's happening with the borders is totally intentional not to get people from Mexico to come across and work on the farms, but using that in order to get terrorists over, Chinese nationals over, Venezuela emptied their prisons and told the prisoners to go north and go into America. And I absolutely believe it's intentional. I believe there are really bad people in the government of the United States that have a plan to take down America. I know that's a radical statement, but we're dealing with a bad element here. And then we look at the economy. You mentioned $33 trillion. Nobody can really wrap their mind around $1 trillion, let alone $33 trillion. The collapse will come. The Bible tells us it's going to come. And these people know it. These are smart people that are running these things behind the scene. They are using these things. I believe they're using the wokeism. They're using the economy. They're using the borders. All of these things to destroy all that's good. Isaiah chapter 5 is very specific. Hey, there's going to be a time when right is wrong and wrong is right. And we see what they are doing, the gaslighting that's taking place, that's deceiving people. But this world is prepared, and especially, Jan, I believe, The Western world is being radically conditioned for what is coming, where they're going to submit to this, because I even believe the Antichrist comes out of the Western world. You bring up an interesting issue. You talk about it in your book. I've heard you talk about it in other interviews as well. You talk about the church of wokeism, and also at the same time, you do talk about, I think in an intriguing way, the potential role, of course, of the Catholic Church, of the Pope, etc., again, in the last day's context playing one more clip of you, and you're talking about this, and I felt that you summed it up particularly well here, and then you included even some of the current anti-Semitic sentiment going on around the world. It kind of goes into the wokeism aspect again, because when we look at the anti-Semitic movement, now we know biblically 
anti-Semitism would hit these incredibly high, wicked levels during the tribulation period. But I think what's being exposed right now with the anti-Semitism that is worldwide, it is global. I, I believe Satan knows he's in a position, for one thing, he knows he has a little time. Yes. The other thing is he knows he's in a position right now to exercise his power and show his true colors. And that's what he's doing. He's being exposed, but he's also doing this. He's the one that's driving this. And what we are finding yeah. out, we are finding out just how many people in the world really are given over to his deceptions when we look at anti-Semitism. And the reason why I say wokeism has played its, uh, uh, a certain hand in this is because wokeism says these people over here are oppressed and they've been taught this in universities, in schools, corporations, let's get on the side of those who are oppressed. And the narrative, the evil narrative, that Satan has used his minions on this earth to dream up regarding Israel is those Jews, they're so big and bad, they are so awful, those poor Palestinian people. Look at the poor Hamas. They wouldn't be that way if it wasn't for those evil Jews. Oh yeah. So wokeism, the whole attitude has fed into that. Let's get a, let's come along the side of the poor oppressed Palestinian people at Hamas, who are really just freedom fighters. I mean, we know it's a lie, but it's being sold and it's sold easily because this is the conditioning and the conditioning process is increasing ever more. So Tom, help my audience understand how what you just shared there ties into the book, Marking the Masses, and that you also believe wokeism in the church plays a role, so does perhaps the Catholic Church. Definitely, and this has been going on for a long, long time. So when we look at wokeism, it's understanding wokeism is not just about gender. It's also about the climate laws. It's about a social justice. You combine all of these different things. Now, we know they are all lies. In that clip where I was talking about what's going on over in Israel and anti-Semitism, we have a world that has been conditioned for the people to be social justice warriors. And so what does social justice warrior do? Well, once a particular people is labeled as being the oppressed people, underprivileged people, well, then you come to their side. So that's all they hear. The people don't know the facts. We've all seen the interviews on the streets when somebody goes up and asks somebody who's supporting Hamas, waving the Palestinian flag, they'll go up and ask them, what is from the river to the sea Palestine will be free. What does it mean? They don't even know what they're singing. They don't recognize Hamas as being this terror organization. Very interesting also, Jan, when we look at the wokeism that is taught, think of it like this. People's brains are being rewired without technology yet. Imagine what happens a couple more years from now with technology, but right now they're being rewired by the brainwashing that is taking place in elementary schools, in junior highs, and high schools, and universities for a long time. And then you realize the majority of people that are believing these lies have the medium age of 30 years old worldwide. That is the majority of people who live on the planet. So when we see this developing, and we see it coming from the Catholic Church, I personally believe that the Catholic Church and the Pope himself is perhaps the biggest and most evil promoter of wokeism. He's like the false prophet of Revelation chapter 13, claims to be Christian, we know he's not, but Revelation 13 tells us about the false prophet, what? He has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Man, if that doesn't define the Pope, now I'm not saying the Pope is the false prophet, but it's not him, it's, yeah. I think it's probably the one after him. But this has been going on a long time. In my book, I quote the Pope from 1963, he said the exact same thing this Pope is saying. Pope Benedict, just before this guy, he was saying the exact same thing. This Pope has taken it to another level, but we are seeing the true colors. And I want to say this also regarding anti-Semitism, since I brought it up in that clip. It's going to be simmered down currently because Antichrist is going to rise to power. This global system is coming. However, the anti-Semitism has been exposed. Jesus himself said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When this is all triggered again during the tribulation period against Israel, all this anti-Semitism is going to resurface and it's going to be worse than it ever was before. And I just want to shout the warnings. People, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him only. 
I think what you and I are saying, Tom, is a religious system needs to be in place as well when this final seven-year time of Jacob's trouble comes on the scene. It's not necessarily an all-new religious system, this one world religion that will be a part of the system. It's forming, been around here for many, many years already, but will be very, very in place at the start of Daniel's 70th week. Oh, yeah, and I look at wokeism as really being this shaping of that system. Let me put it like this. I don't believe these globalists at the top actually think transgenderism is a good idea. I think if they think it's a good idea for their agenda because they're able to manipulate the masses of people, hence they go after the young people the way that Hitler did with the Nazis, start training them while they're young. I know they don't believe the climate laws that they're shoving down everybody's throat. They can't possibly believe that all of their social justice programs are good, the DEI and everything else we are hearing about. But this is interesting because in Revelation chapter 17, John is writing and he says this, then the angel said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and the 10 horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. I find that so fascinating because just prior to that in chapter 17, God makes it clear that the 10 kings use this harlot religious system in the tribulation period to get their power and to install antichrist and then they completely do away with this harlot system. Why do they do that? Because they know it's a lie, they've gotten out of her what they need and I believe that's what's happening right now. This world is being shaped, which is another reminder we have to stay in the word. The deception is gonna increase, the delusions are going to increase, Jesus warned the deception will be so great during the tribulation, if possible, even the yes. elect would be deceived. But we must stay in the word. We can't be moved to the left or the right. Learn more at hopeforourtimes.com, hopeforourtimes.com. Follow Tom online almost every day, or certainly many times a week. He updates things, YouTube as well, prophecy updates, interviews, other presentations. By the way, Tom, your New Year's Eve was absolutely superb. You had Pastor Brandon and David Tall and yourself. I think you were under the weather, but you did an incredible job. And that's posted to YouTube as well, perhaps to Hope for Our Times as well. Yes, that's both on the website and on the YouTube, which is called Hope for Our Times. I'm going to bring on here in the next minute or two Pastor Brandon Holthouse. And let me just set the stage before I do that. And first, let me ask you, Tom, because I think next week you're actually heading for Australia, along with Armando Gonzalez, Billy Crone, our rep, Ken Michael, Pastor Brandon, Pete Garcia, and you're going to, I believe, Queensland, Australia, to the Until He Comes conference. Anybody listening in Australia, they need to know about it, but even as important, they can live stream this. Give us a commercial of about a minute here. The live stream is going to be over the top. The teaching is going to be really great, everyone. I mean, you're going to get fantastic teaching if you register for the live stream. But also know this, we are not coming away from the conference with any profit at all. All of the proceeds from the live stream are going to support a ministry called Gihon Springs, which is an outreach with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the Messianic community in Israel. It's pro-life also. You can check it out, just click on Hope for Our Times at the events on the Australia live stream, and you'll see everything it supports, but all of the prophets go there. Great cause, and the most important cause is the hope of Jesus. This world needs Jesus Christ. Where are you in Queensland, Tom? Gold Coast at, I believe it's a church. It is a good-sized facility. We're excited about it. Yeah, we're going to be there then also down in New Zealand too, but it's going to be a just terrific conference there. I hope everybody can join us in live stream. Anybody in Australia, if there's still room, Register, we'd love to meet you guys. Hopeforourtimes.com, folks, find out the info there. So I'm going to the back of your book, Tom, and I'm just reading a paragraph. And it says, should the world fear the future? Well, you and I, we don't have to, but let me read what this says here. It says, marking the masses is a wake-up call to believers and unbelievers alike regarding an agenda that was set in motion by an elite group one night, 1961, overlooking Los Angeles from the Hollywood Hills. You say, since that night, at the dawn of modern computerization, the plan to enslave society has been woven into 
every aspect of our lives. Today, 60 years later, the pieces are now in place and the catalyst to trigger the rapid and conclusive collapse of the world as we know it is about to begin and you're already a part of it. Now, Tom, that sounds a little bit ominous. Why don't you just give some assurance that listeners don't have to be afraid? You don't have to be afraid if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, Jan, I specifically wrote the book and designed it for a witnessing tool yeah. that people could share it with their friends. And even though I've been a pastor for 30 years, I didn't want it to come across as a religious book. So I wrote it in a way that wasn't too religious, that would scare the non-religious away. I wrote it in a way that the non-believer would totally connect with it. It's hard to ignore the facts that are in there. And I really wanted the believer to be able to learn from it, but the believer to be able to hand it to their friends and say, hey, you got to check this out because it will be a wake up call. And I do believe that people will come to faith in Christ because of some of the things in the book that lead them to the gospel itself. And we also have the gospel in the book for that purpose. I think the real wake up call is going to be millions missing, maybe even a billion missing. Absolutely. Listen, when that rapture takes place, people are going to know, wow, this is what my friend told me about. Yep. And this is why we need to be so faithful, folks. We can see the finish line. And we want to do as the Apostle Paul said, we want to run as hard and as fast as we can. Now is not the time to quit. Now is not the time to give up. Now is the time to say, we can see it. Let's roll. And Jesus is going to call us home. It could happen at any moment. I think some of the events, even of the last three and a half, four months, tell me that it's no longer a minute to midnight, Tom. I think it's about 10 seconds to midnight now. Watching things line up in the Middle East, watching Israel become the goat of the whole world, etc., I think it's a new day. And I think we've been in a run-up to the tribulation for the last few decades. And now we've got the run-up here in the last few minutes. Joining us now for the balance of the hour, Pastor Brandon Holthouse, Rock Harbor Church, Bakersfield, California. Welcome back, Pastor Brandon. Thank you, Jan, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on with you. You've heard our little discussion here with Tom Hughes and myself. Just give me your feedback on it. Tom's spot on, and what we're expecting in 2024 is a lot of black swan events yep. and possible created crises that they're manufacturing to get their agenda in place. With everything that Tom said, 2024 is going to be a pivotal year on a lot of issues, whether you're talking about central bank digital currency, a collapse of the economy, or the hatred foisted towards Israel. I think we should expect as prophecy students to see a lot of changes very quickly in this next year. Brandon, you and Tom have been spending extensive time in Israel, and I mean since October the 7th. Of course, you were in Israel many times before that. It's just a whole new picture now since early October of 2023. I've talked with you on a few occasions, emailed many occasions as to the fact that you're both spending time. You're just back again. You were with me perhaps a month ago, and you were just gotten back at that time as well. You're really on a mission of mercy over there, and I want some feedback from both of you. Tom, let me start with you, because I'm perceiving that America is in a rapid turning on the nation of Israel. Let's be honest. American policies are pro-Iran. That sounds like lunacy, and it is but America's policies are pro-Iran. They are not pro-Israel. How do you see the people of Israel responding to that? And I've heard your interviews on a few other places, including YouTube, and I know the answer to that, which is shocking, but please take that question and handle it for me. It's a strange thing. In fact, Brandon and I had this great conversation when we were in Israel and a few times since. There's an openness in Israel right now to hear about Jesus, but there's also this strange delusion with so many people in Israel that think Biden is wonderful. The lies are coming out of the White House, and it is, hey, look at the right hand over here. We are really taking care of you while they give billions of dollars to Iran. So there's this deception that's going on, but U.S. has been against Israel for a long time. We think back to the time of the Obama administration. They were trying to interrupt the election of Netanyahu back then. And we look at what's going on in Israel right now. The Biden administration, I don't care what anybody says, is not favorable towards Israel. It's a game, and Israel is being manipulated. They're in a very bad position. They count on weapons and ammunition from the U.S., and they're really being controlled by the U.S. And it's absolutely awful what we are seeing. But everybody ignores the fact 
that we've given billions of dollars to Iran. What has Iran done with those billions of dollars? Oh, they funded Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, everyone else. Brandon, you feel that a showdown is coming between the U.S. and Israel. I have heard you say, of course, I agree with you, Israel needs to stop depending on America. That's so hard because we help her with the Iron Dome, we help her with weapons, etc. When I hear you say that, that they need to stop depending on America, then she's heading almost for total isolation. Give me your thoughts here. What we see in the last few months, and Tom and I have seen this on the ground, is America has really turned a corner on Israel. It's not backing Israel. And let me explain this. It seemed like America was pro or getting rid of Hamas. And it seems like it was on the same ticket as Israel. But the issue of why the United States wanted to get rid of Hamas is so that they could reinstall the Palestinian Mm -hmm. Authority to run Judea and Samaria and the Gaza Strip. Well, that goes against what Israel wants to do. So Israel is butting heads against the State Department on who's going to run Gaza and the Palestinian Authority of Judea and Samaria. The second budding of heads has to do with the United States' Iranian policy of wanting to establish Iran as a regional dominance in the area to control the other proxies like the Houthis and Hezbollah. And that's obviously an existential threat to Israel. So those two principles right there, puts Israel in the crosshairs with its enemies and becomes a security threat and leaves Israel with saying, look, we can't go along with this. Otherwise, we will be eliminated at some point in time. And I think that's where the break is going to come in the near future, where Israel says, you know what? We can't go along with this policy. Look, the stats on the ground prove it. Like 85%, 87% of Israel does not want to give the Palestinians any authority whatsoever in Gaza, but yet the United States does. So I think prophetically what Tom and I were talking about yesterday was it sends Israel into this independency of, okay, we can't trust the United States anymore. Who can we trust? Mm, right. Well, therein lies the prophetic scenario of where the Antichrist walks in and says, hey, I'll take care of you. I'll be your security. And I think that's what is getting ready to get set up. Make a covenant with me and I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. You don't have to worry about broken fences or broken treaties ever again. Just trust in me. And things will go along fairly well for about three and a half years, and then things suddenly change. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I have on the line with me, both from California, Brandon Holthouse, pastor of Rock Harbor Church, Bakersfield, California. You can look up his convenient church finder at rockharborchurch.net. And Tom Hughes, who has just sort of retired from being a pastor full-time for 12 Church, he's heading Hope for Our Times, hopeforourtimes.com, literally traveling the world trying to make sense of our times, which is getting more and more difficult. Tom, let me address this to you. I think that there still is the illusion, and I think it perhaps is a delusion as well, that the world is clamoring because, again, these supposedly innocent civilians, and some of them are quite innocent. But in Gaza, there are probably a huge majority, as much as 80 percent, that actually did side with Hamas. Am I right there? Absolutely. And it's not just in Gaza. You start looking at Judea and Samaria. Caroline Glick has gone into great details and exposed the facts of what's really going on. So Israel has their hands full. The people have been radicalized in these other areas, too. But you look at this and you go, okay, there are some innocent people in Gaza, no doubt about it. However, it's kind of like going back to Hitler's youth. So when the Palestinian people in Gaza being raised by Hamas are in that environment, guess what they're going to be taught? We've all seen it in the schools. The children are taught to hate the Jews. They're taught these things in the school. You remove the name Israel from the map. They're taught that the Jews are pigs and all these different things. What do you have? You have anti-Semitism being from their youth and apart from the grace of God, that's all that they know. So they're raised to hate the Jews. And this is also happening in Judea Samaria, which the UN and the current US government loves to call the West Bank because they don't want to acknowledge that Israel has any right to the land, but it is all Israel's land. Brandon, you've done this twice now. You're actually delivering some very practical things to the Israelis. 
I think in some cases they're looking rather astonishingly at you and saying, why are you helping us? Help us understand exactly what you're doing and this response. What we have been doing in the last 100 plus days now is we had contacts on the ground there in Israel in the certain units through Messianic believers. They have been telling us what their units need because a lot of the reservists don't have the equipment to fight this war with Hamas or Hezbollah or whoever. So they have been telling us, hey, we need bulletproof vests. We need helmets. We need rain jackets. We need knee pads. We need scopes for our guns. We need night vision. And we've been buying these for these units and these troops. And just to interweave what you guys did, you guys made a donation to it. And we were able to purchase a drone through Olive Tree Ministries. And that drone, Jan, was able to help find Unit 66, a tunnel that saved actually Israeli lives. And what has happened through that is it's opened them up to be more receptive to hearing the truth about Yeshua and the gospel and saying, hey, why are these Christians, these particular ones, who love us and are actually wanting to help us, and the rest of the world hates us? What's different about these people? And so the Messianic believers on the ground have been able to witness to the troops and saying, this is why. It's because of Yeshua. So amidst all this crazy chaos and devastation that Israel's going through, spiritually, it has opened their hearts up to receive this truth that, hey, yes, there are people that love you because of Jesus, and maybe you need to know him. So it's been really neat to see that. There isn't sort of an instant revival going on, but I'm told by you and others, Amir Sarfati and others, that at least folks in Israel are starting to reconsider the whole concept, if I can say it this way, of God and his provision and protection. Am I right? Absolutely. And the stats prove it. The younger generation is going towards being more religious in their approach rather than what we see in America. So it is actually happening. There's a return back to God as a movement as a whole in Israel. So it's a neat thing to see. And perhaps this is God's way of trying to get their attention and trying to get things moving so that they don't miss the rapture. Tom, your perspective on this? Absolutely, Jim. Both Brandon and I, we had an amazing time when we were there. There was an opportunity that we had to pray with a gentleman whose son is still a hostage as of today. It was a very sad story, but his son was at the concert with four of his friends, two girls and two guys. The guys come down in the ultralights. They start shooting at all the people. They got in a car and fled. Their car was shot at. Somebody was killed in their car, and the car was shot up. It pulled over, stalled out. Three people ran to the right. This gentleman's son ran to the left. He was brought into our room, and it's understanding these are three Israeli Jews that don't have any desire at all for Jesus prior to right now and bring into the room this dad whose son is a hostage. Imagine the horror and the pain and the suffering he's going through. Mm. And he gave his story. And then this is amazing, Jim. I've never seen this happen before. This room full of Jews and pastors asked us to pray. And we prayed in the name of Jesus, Mm. laid hands on this Mm. man. And they even asked when we were done, if we would continue to pray knowing we're praying in the name of Jesus. And Brandon and I, we were both at a studio later on. It was the same day. And brought before us were, I think it was 10 Messianic pastors, Brandon, Yeah, that we got to meet and hear. It is an incredible thing that's happening, which leads me to believe, Jan, as I'm watching this, we are so close to going home with the Lord. I believe God is using these things right now, the horrible things that are happening to prepare Israel for their Messiah, because we know there's a massive turning in Israel to the Messiah during the tribulation. But right now, he's even saving people. Brandon Holdhouse, how can my audience participate financially in what you're doing in Israel? Go to rockharborchurch.net, go to our giving tab, and then you'll see on that tab a way of blessing Israel. And there's several things that you can scroll down, but go to the giving tab of blessing Israel. And what that will do is that money goes directly to the ground, to the IDF guys, the soldiers. We're now starting a fund for the families that have been displaced, that don't have any homes. And then know this, that that money that goes to buy a drone, a helmet, a backpack, whatever for them, then the Messianic believer delivers the gospel messages and tells them 
this is why. It's not just a social justice yes. thing. It is we're using the equipment as a springboard to share the gospel. And that's how you can help. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Mark Hill I have on the line, both from Southern California, Brandon Holthouse, pastor, Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California. Learn more at rockharborchurch.net. Tom Hughes just stepped down, senior pastor, 412 Church in San Jacinto, but he is running Hope for Our Times, hopeforourtimes.com. Very active book writing, conference activity, online activity, much, much more. His channel, Christian Television. Gentlemen, I've got a few minutes left here, and I want to touch this very sensitive subject. I'm suggesting we can be quite frank here, but some people have taken what I'm about to talk about too far, and that is it would appear that the Israeli military, some within military and perhaps intelligence, were quite reckless and even irresponsible when it came to the October 7th disaster. There were some who were warning of it, warned their military superiors that something very strange was going on in Gaza. It appeared that they were planning exactly what happened October 7th, and the military higher-ups said, well, I think they suggested you're imagining things. They didn't take it seriously. They did not follow through. Apparently, that mindset did not get all the way up to Benjamin Netanyahu. Brandon, give me your perspective on this. I've heard you talk about it. We need to be blunt. It's very tough to even hear about. I don't know what to say about Finkelman, Barr, Halivi, and Haliva. These are the guys, the intelligence and the Southern generals that were warned repeatedly over and over again for the last five months, even the morning of, and they blew it off. And like I was telling Tom, one of the things that came out of this is perhaps their wokeness, like our woke generals. They blew it off. Many of them said because that would never happen because we're giving economic prosperity to the people of Palestine and they would never, never think about attacking us. And then at the same time, Carolyn Glick revealed this and Halivav, one of the southern generals, his family was working all of last year to upset Netanyahu and destroy that coalition that had been duly elected in Israel. And again, I'm not connecting to Halivav, but his family was involved. When you start adding all this together, there's some gaps there. How is it that these generals and intelligence sources ignored the warnings? Honestly, Matt, when it's all said and done, somebody's going to have to be accountable for this because a lot of people got killed. Is there any supernatural component to what you just said, Brandon? And then, Tom, I want your perspective on the supernatural component. But, Brandon, you start. Well, I think definitely the God of this world, Satan, will blind people's minds. And we all know that when you suppress the truth, you go crazy, according to Romans 1. When these guys suppress the truth over and over again, you start losing your mind. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. With this suppressing of information, they had to come up with a false narrative. And I think that false narrative has led to a major catastrophe in Israel's predicament. And it sets them up for more problems. If Israel's military continues to think like this, they're going to be so messed up by a Gog of Magog invasion, by a Psalm 83 invasion, they will have to fall into the hands of the Antichrist. So I think the spirit of Antichrist was working through this is where I'm ending up at. Tom, give me your thoughts on this. Interesting. I got a text from someone over in Israel yesterday. I won't mention their name. It basically said we have victory in Gaza. We know we have that now secured. A little bit more work to do there. They're looking for hostages. But then he said someone has to control Gaza. And he said it will not be us. In other words, it will not be Israel. We're not going to do it. So they're set up for that leader. And I don't think it's a coincidence, Jen, on this supernatural level that what's happening has happened in Israel on October 7 and right now, it's reminiscent of Samson from Judges chapter 17. What does he do? He's feeling very powerful. No one can defeat me. Where does he go of all places? He goes to Gaza. He leaves Gaza with the gates. And where does he go? He ends up with Delilah, where he's lulled to sleep. He thinks he's powerful. His eyes are gouged out. And then we know what happened from there. So it's not a coincidence. Israel is in a spot, but I do believe that God is moving in Israel. 
and he's moving them to the place of repentance and surrender to him. And God is a prophetic calendar, and we are watching this calendar move. It's like it's moved to the next day, and we are so, so close. But God is the God of Israel. Brandon, you want to sum things up here. Is there something in your travels to Israel, your conversations over there that's urgent that we're overlooking here? If so, you've got at least two minutes for that. I think what I would say to remnant believers out there, now is the time to take your stand for Israel because the church is failing in this stand. The church is deciding to take a neutral position. Yes, It's taking a cowardly position. Because now standing for Israel is a dividing point. And Tom and I have talked about this. And there is no neutral ground. You must be on the side of Israel. Not that I support their military moves or their political moves, but I support the Jewish people. I support their right to the land and their right to exist as a free people. You have to take that stand. And what's happening, Jan, churches are backing off on this. Man, if the church is not going to support Israel, then who will? The concern that Israel has had and voiced to us, even through the Israeli consulate, is where are the evangelicals that used to support us? Especially among the younger evangelicals, they're not there. I'm talking about the people, Jan, that believe like you and I and Tom do. Where are they? Why are they so silent? How come they don't rally the troops to say, hey, man, we're going to take a stand for Israel. We're going to raise money for the Israeli army. Why are we not doing anything? So the silence is deafening, and I think it's time to stand up now. I have done entire radio programs on that, folks, the silence of the shepherds and the theologies here that are in the way. We've talked about them, replacement theology, amillennial, et cetera. Tom, your perspective on this as far as what Brandon just shared? We see the exact same thing. It's remarkable when we went through the last four years of what we went through, we saw great separation within churches and pastors. We saw wokeism on steroids, but what has happened now with Israel has defined the church that much more. I believe God is separating the wheat from the chaff. And when I look at Matthew chapter 25, for example, when Jesus talks about visiting someone in prison and offering a cold cup of water, that is specific to the people of Israel during the tribulation period. And I'm looking at what's going on right now, and I'm just shouting the warning everywhere I possibly can because there are people within dead churches that are listening, that are saying there's something wrong here. Why is my pastor not talking about this? I believe they're cowardly and we need to have courage and guts and we need to press forward. And if there's any pastors listening, listen, be encouraged, do what's right, stand on God's side in this and don't listen to the radical peers who are shouting you down. Tell me where you think, and I am down now to about a minute and a half or so, but where you think U.S.-Israel relations are going. We're early in 2024 here, and we talked about this throughout the hour here, but we have an election year going on right now. Do you think this will be beneficial for foreign policy, specifically Middle East, more specifically Israel? Not beneficial? Brandon, give me a minute, and then Tom a minute. I think with this next election, it's going to hurt Israel. Israel is the bad guy in the situation. Unfortunately, according to the deep state of the United States, when you start seeing Israel as the problem, then what's the solution? Well, the solution for the deep state is to eliminate Israel. That's what it is. And that narrative is not going to change. That's going to be carried all the way through prophecy into the end time. So I don't see anything changing for the positive in the next election cycle in the United States, especially when you have people that are anti-Israel in our government. And those people were unelected. They're bureaucratic. You can't get them out. And then you add in Davos. Then you add in the UN and the World Economic Forum. They're anti-Israel as well, because as Tom pointed out, they fit into the oppressor category of wokeism. That's where they're putting Israel, and that's not going to change. Tom, one minute. I wholeheartedly, obviously, agree with Brandon on this. It's not going to go well for Israel, but it's not going to go well for the U.S. either. Bill Koenig has talked a lot about those things when the U.S. goes against Israel. However, Israel's being set up. Going back to this text from our Israeli friend yesterday, this is what he said. We just need somebody to rule and control the place afterwards. Israel will not do it. Guess what? The setup is here, and Israel is in a place where we will take whoever can really promise us that we feel comfortable with. 
this is coming like a freight train, and right now the U.S. is driving this thing with these globalists. Gentlemen, thank you so much for what you're doing, from your writing to your work in Israel and all that both of you are doing online is just simply awesome. Again, the book, Marking the Masses, it's in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. And you can call my office as well, get on our newsletter list. That conference in Queensland, Australia, February 2nd, 3rd, and that would be Tom Hughes, Mondo Gonzalez, Pete Garcia, Billy Crone, Ken Michael, who is our rep, Brandon Holthouse. You can stream it, hopeforourtimes.com. In February 2nd, 3rd, Queensland, I believe. Then you're going to New Zealand, am I right? Yes, and with Australia, we don't get any profit from it. All the proceeds for Livestream go to Israel to support the messianic cause there, too. God bless you both, gentlemen. Let me go out with a little outro I haven't used in a long time. Why don't you always look back and thank him, look around and serve him, look ahead and trust him, but always look up and expect him. He's coming again. I want to thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. We hope you will be salt and light in this darkening world The prophets of old longed to be a part of this generation, for they knew the orchestrated events would tell us that all things are falling into place.